La Casas has been successful at creating Verapaz in uh, Guatemala, modern day Guatemala, and uh, converting large portions of the Mayan population uh, to Christianity. And <clears throat> now he returns to Spain and based upon that success now, he, like he has some momentum again, he's going to take another run at it and, and try to approach um, King Charles and, and make more gains uh, to protect the human rights of the indigenous people of Latin America. You know, so he's just, he's just constantly working at it. Like he gets defeated and then, but then he gets a success and he tries to build upon that. He just, he's a fighter. Uh, it's really quite inspirational. And I think something that we need to think about as we get deeper into the course material is that, you know, this is one of the the historical figures that Father Oscar Romero looked to as, you know, a hero and, and something that he modeled himself upon. It's like, no matter how defeated you are, you got to come back. And, and when you when you get those wins, you got to exploit that to the fullest extent. And Father Romero uh, did that in a pretty, in a way that I think we can connect with more than with La Casas. Uh, Romero, you know, when we look at the details, it's like, we know what he was facing and how, how hard that was. I mean, La Casas probably was facing something very similar, but through the fog of history, it doesn't seem as visceral. But the case of Romero is very, very uh, penetrating. And I, I think, uh, you know, La Casas is a role model for Romero. Um, so, um, La Casas returns to Spain for a few years, and he does, upon returning, uh, secure a royal decree from Charles prohibiting uh, secular colonization of Arapaz for five years, so that there not, could not be any encomiendas in this, you know, conquistador model for at least five years, um, per the maybe verbal promise of the governor of the region. And he also secured a dictum from the Franciscan theologians. Okay, so the Franciscans were the ones that he argued against earlier on about mass conversions and everything, he was con able to convince the leading Franciscan theologians at Salamanca uh, to con condemn mass baptism. All right, so uh, uh, two big wins here. Um, and he's also able to get Emperor Charles to hold some hearings on the treatment of the indigenous Americans. So this is 1542. And in the midst of this, he issues a, a short account of the destruction of the Indies, which is another book that we have from La Casas. Um, so this is presented at the hearings and uh, by all accounts, largely based on this book, um, King Charles issues the new laws, new laws for the colonies, for um, 
Latin America. And the main points of it, I wanted to go to this page here. Uh, so this is the Wikipedia page. So governors had an obligation to take care of all of the well-being and preserve Native Americans, uh, referred to as Indians by law, okay, that there were no uh, there was no motive to enslave them in the future, not by war, nor due to rebellion, nor to ask for rescue, nor for any reason or in any way. Okay, so this is very significant. That not under any pretense could indigenous Americans be enslaved. There's just no. <laughs> it's like it covers every angle. Um, and that the Native Americans currently enslaved must be freed immediately unless the owner could prove, uh, okay, in Spain, um, the full juridical legitimacy, okay, so there might be some legal way of maintaining current slaves, but future slaves, out. And that the bad habit of making Native Americans work as uh, tamamens, uh, against their will or without fair payment must be ended imme immediately. So uh, Tamames are uh, just laborers, but um, we might call them like Sherpas, like in the, right, in uh, Kathmandu and, you know, going up to Mount Everest. Um, we have Sherpas who are like guides, but also like people who carry all the shit on their back. Um, uh, that was a that was like a thing. Like uh, the conquistadors would have people carry them around, like like on you know carry them on their shoulders, like carry the person on their shoulders. And, and like, you know, work them like horses or mules and, and have them carry heavy lo loads of all sorts. And, and so they're, they're just saying, like, this can't be practiced. Um, that they must not be taken to remote regions to fish pearls. So you like basically enslave people to have them uh, fish for pearls. And that the viceroy, viceroy, the governor, had the right to establish encomiendas on Native Americans, that only the viceroy. Okay, so this is a disruption of the feudal order uh, or a clarification, maybe, because we did see, like, back uh, when I was talking about the medieval feudal order, at a certain level, there was a ground level at which feudal landholders could not further distribute land holdings. Um, but that's part of the problem of the uh, encomiendas in Latin America is that there was always new land. And they were so far away from the center of government that they could just indefinitely build this pyramid out. And uh, so this sets a, a ground floor that the viceroy sitting in, in Santa Domingo in Hispaniola was the only lord that could, that could grant an encomienda. So that's quite significant. Because they were just like loosey goosey, you know, expanding this all sorts of ways. And that the distribution of people and lands, serfs that belong to the land, um, given to the original uh, conquistadors, should stop immediately after their death. Okay, so that the land holdings. Um, that were legal 
would end because remember in the feudal order that a landlord didn't really own the land in the way that we think of land ownership as property. The whole notion of property as we know it today didn't exist. It was just a land holding from the king ultimately through some pyramidal structure, but that could be revoked at any time. And here's the revocation of that. And so the king is saying, after you die in Kamiondaro, that's it. You, your, your sons cannot inherit the land. And so it's really creating a stop to that and um, so that the serfs, uh, the campesinos living on the land now, along with the land, would become uh, a vassal state to the king. So this incorporates some of Lacassus' thinking, this idea of creating uh, vassal states of the indigenous people that are directly vassals of the king without the layers of the pyramid structure. Um, and, and the new laws are very influenced by Lacassus and by his argumentation. So we had the ear of Charles, you know, he had public support because Charles wouldn't have done it if he didn't have public support. You know, he's able to get in front of all these governors, like he's somehow very persuasive. Um, and, and this is really a, a, a coup, like he's really, uh, managed to get something incredible in place, considering the conditions on the ground, which he knew intimately, but which Charles did not know intimately, and everybody living at, back in Spain did not know intimately. He knew what was going on, and he gets these legal uh, pronouncements on paper, but the question is, can we implement them? Can we enforce them in practice? Okay. So, um, so Cristobal uh, Vaca de Castro is a newly appointed governor at this time, going out to Peru for the first time, landing there. And when he gets there, there's a civil war going on amongst the conquistadors. It's like craziness. And uh, Gonzalo Pizarro, he's the brother of Francisco Pizarro, um, forcefully protests the attempt to implement the new laws and um, convinces uh, Vaca de Castro to plead the case of the Encampiandaros uh, to the king, you know, so he's like, okay, uh, Vaca de Castro is like, okay, I'm not gonna go up against this conquistador to <laughs> try to implement these laws. Like, it's a civil war. It's, it's, it's um, all out mayhem in Peru at this point. Uh, because it's not just that the conquistadors are fighting against the indigenous Incas, but the conquistadors are fighting amongst themselves. And um, so he balks, okay. And then Antonio de Mendoza, the viceroy of New Spain, so that's the more established part of the Spanish empire uh, in the Americas. He doesn't even attempt to implement the new laws. You know, he says, uh, uh, I can't remember the phrase, but he says, uh, you know, I am subject to the crown, but nonetheless, I, I disagree. Like, he's like, I'm not, I'm not being treasonous. I just cannot implement this policy. He's like, it's just not possible. It's just not politically possible. Um, so he doesn't even really attempt, he does uh, maybe soft pedal some of the provisions, but 
but largely doesn't do anything. Um, after Vaca de la Castro, we have uh, Blasco Nunez Vela, um, first viceroy. Okay, so he has a higher title uh, of Peru. He's really charged by Charles to like get these new laws enforced, and um, and he goes into Peru and he tries to implement the new laws by force against Pizarro, Gonzalo Pizarro, and ends up involved in the whole civil war and and is killed in battle um, by uh, Gonzalo's rebel army, um, you know, has his head cut off, they put it on a pike, they parade it around, and, um, and Gonzalo is even uh, becomes so emboldened as to proclaim himself king of Peru as like they really are rebelling and trying to create an independent kingdom uh, uh, apart from Spain. Um, so that wasn't so successful. Okay. <laughs> uh, La Casas, meanwhile, has continued to argue for measures over and above the new laws because the new laws weren't really in line with his whole philosophy. Um, they were some concessions to what he wanted, but but not not nearly close to what he really wanted. And um, he continues to he continues to argue the case. Um, and right about this time, uh, in the midst of this this rebellion in Peru. Juan Guinness de, de Sepulveda writes a book called Another Democritus, uh, or Another Democritus, uh, who's an ancient Greek philosopher, but there's some ambiguity about the text uh, that are attributed to him. Um, or on the just causes of war against the Indians. And so he, he makes an argument of just war against the indigenous Americans, saying that they're unable to rule themselves because they're barbarians. And he draws upon Aristotelian concepts to construct this narrative and ultimately argues that they must be pacified by force. Um, so Sepulveda is involved in a kind of casuistry that I discussed before. Uh, he was not a Jesuit. Um, I can't remember what order he was from. I think, I think I'm going to say that he's a Franciscan, but I'm not sure about that. But, but he's not a Jesuit. But, um, but the Jesuits were just uh, ordained in 1540. So um, they haven't really risen to prominence yet, but Sepulveda is one of these early instances of casuistry where, you know, he has a predetermined conclusion that he wants to reach, and then he just uses every mechanization to try to rationally, but not really rationally, because if you think about it and question it, it doesn't work out. But if you don't question it, it kind of seems rational. You know, it's dressed up in rational argumentation um, that uh, indigenous, indigenous Americans are, are quasi-human and need to be mastered by the Spanish, um, by the Europeans. So it's a very Eurocentric uh, argumentation, which um, is questionable even amongst the Spanish. Okay, so it's not like 
all Spanish were like on board with this, but those in favor or who those who had a vested interest, money interest in colonization and enslavement of indigenous people latched on to these these uh, arguments of casuistry. You know, this is kind of how casuistry begins to have a bad name. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm going to stop this here and create a new section and then we'll move on.